tournament kingfisher uh, because the King of Beach tournament is coming up. So primarily, we're going to talk about the main way that we we do our tournament kingfishing is live bait kingfishing. Not to say that we don't use some dead baits here and there, but live bait kingfishing. Dominic has quite a few rigs here. Before you use your rigs, you got to catch live bait, right, Dom? Oh yeah. And how do we do that? Well, first of all, lady fish is you know one of the number one baits you can use on the beach, and even um, on the sandbars. I'll pass these around. You can use them on a 3,000, 15 pound mainline, 30 pound gator. You can also, while you're fishing for ladyfish, you can even catch bluefish, is also a good bait, and um, silver chow also. As you're moving like the smaller baits, you can use white bait, thread fin, and you can catch those on these smaller sabikis. Your, your inshore bait are using them. There's some other fish that you can use are shad and mullet, which you're going to have a hard time catching shad and mullet. You're going to have to know how to throw cast. Any size mullet is great. Shad, sometimes you'll, you'll get the little peanut shad. They'll be right here by the bridge fenders and inside the pass, up by Madeira Beach School. You can usually cast them with a smaller uh, cast net. But what you really want to get is the big bunker shad. A lot of times they'll be out here between these islands and down towards Treasure Island off the Admiral Farragut side. You'll be able to find a cast net on that. Most of the time, you're going to need uh, a cast net, probably 3 8 mesh, and probably you know 10, 12 foot. I I can only throw a 10 foot one anymore because the old shoulder don't do what it used to. Those are your basic inshore baits that you're going to find. Your offshore baits are going to be your Sligarminos and Blue Runners. You're primarily going to sabiki those up with the larger size sabikis. That's right here, but you might have to cut them in half. There's eight hooks on one, but if you cut them in half in four, I'll pass them around. What size? Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a 15, I believe. Yeah, it's all in Japanese. But normally you cut them in half, so there's four hooks on each. We normally use like 6,000, 8,000 spinning reel for our blue runners. Based on if you get four on one, they're going to be tugging. But this is just our normal you know, baby fishing rod, jig rod, short. With, um, I think I have a 40 pound braid on here, but you can use mono if you like it. It's all a personal preference. Another thing that, that is real, sometimes necessary to do, is to tip your, your sabiki with shrimp. Especially if you're looking for the bigger blue runners. Uh, you can use them inshore, you can use them offshore, you can use them at the, like the, the Anna Maria Green Bell outside Southwest Pass. A real good place to run into them, but you can find them all the way out offshore on offshore wrecks. That way, if you if you have a problem with some of your bait dives, it's not going to be too far away. You can go to the chemical barge, you can go to the pin barge, you can go to the Betty Bros, and you can usually pick up bait with a sabiki. Well, with the sabikis, depending on the current, you might want to use different weights. We normally get the two ounce uh, sabiki weights. And if you need more weight, you just put one more on. It's just a little snap swivel. After you get your baits, you really, you want to get your rigs to match your baits and your sizes. It's, it's important to size your, your bait rig to your bait. You don't want to use a 6 inch or a 7 inch stinger that's made for a big blue runner on a thread fin or on those little white baits. One other thing you can do with those little baits is you can always double it. One white bait on the, on the lead hook and another one on the, on the stinger. you notice most of these have stinger hooks, which by stinger hook we mean a treble that is dangling behind and can be embedded or can also be free swinging in a bait. Because kingfish are notorious short strikers. They come up and they just will make a pass at a bait a lot of times you'll see them come out of the water and come down and miss a bait. But they'll also hit a bait a lot of times too. So when they hit it, the reel just starts screaming. And, uh, that's what you want. That's what you're looking for. Number four treble hook and a four out J-hook lead hook. And on this one we have a skirt. What are your favorite colors? Well, if, if you're going to use a skirt, my favorite colors are the green and pink for, for skirts. It's just it seems like a, a fishing tradition to use chartreuse and, and pink. If you go down to Costa Rica and you fish for sailfish, they're going to run a pink teaser and a, and a green teaser. And uh, so 
I just used the same things. Whatever produces some flash, that's used more in, in some dirty water. The cleaner the water is, the more the kingfish can see the bait. And I do believe they get spooked. I do believe that, that they are wary. And uh, many times the swivel and other things will, will alert them. A lot of times you're going to have to downsize. Most of this wire here is 40 to 60 pound. Sometimes when you're in real clear water, you're going to have to go down to 31 pound wire to get the bite. And you're going to lose some fish. They're going to bite through that wire. But you need to get those bites. You know, so one friend of mine, Steve Shook, many years ago, I thought he was crazy. He came up, he would paint his rigs, both the hooks and the wire, a sea green to match the water. I thought that was going a little bit over for But when you're when you're slow trolling bait, you're gonna be slow trolling these live baits. And you're gonna be going at a very slow speed. You're just gonna be in gear. Sometimes you have to drag a bucket to slow the boat down. You're gonna be doing one and a half to two knots. That's what you wanna look for when you are our live bait slow trolling. Other dead baits will work with those live baits. A ribbon fish trolls beautifully at that speed. A dead Spanish mackerel trolls great. You can uh, also, other baits that you can troll dead are, are ballyhoos and cigar minnows. Those, those you're going to have to pick up your speed a little bit to get a little bit more action in the bait itself. You got a ribbon fish rig there. They usually have we usually use a weighted head on them. That'll keep the, the ribbon fish straight and it won't be just flopping around there on its side. That way it'll look like it's actually swimming in the, uh, in the current. You tie your rigs onto a kingfish pole. The kingfish pole has to have some action. Well, this is a dogfish stick, 10 to 25. They also have a kingfish series, which is pretty good. But this is like for fun fishing. And you can use it for tournaments, but it's all you prefer. You just want to want to rod with a lot of backbone. So if you want to put the pressure on the fish, you can. But you want a light tip because when you snag, you're basically snagging the kingfish when it comes after it while it jumble hooks. So if you have a real stiff tip, it's going to not give the action, and it's going to just you're going to be pulling hooks. And also the best rod if you can find them are the Shimano taluses. Find them is the hard part. I use various kinds. Uh, a good economical rod is a red bone and an ugly stick. You can find them in the in the seven foot, seven foot six inch. But you basically want a flexible tip on them, and you also want uh, some backbone right down in this part of the rod. The reels have to hold 300 yards of line because that a big kingfish is going to take 300 yards of line. And we use usually use 40 pound tests. You need a smooth drag. You're going to want to set your drag very light, two to four pounds of drag on on uh, your drag setting. What what reels do you use, Doc? Um, right here we have a 30, a Torium 30. Um, that's just affordable pricing, but you can get a TLD or even a uh, Trinidad. But if you're fishing somewhere else, like Key West, or you've been what? Uh, yeah, you want 30 because you can be horsing off for bigger fish and get them away from the shark. If you want to use the Yozuri. 30 to 40 pound. Start with 40. If you're not getting hit, go down to 30. And if you get broke off, go back up to 40. How much leader do you use, though? About 10 foot, really, so you don't want to get tail whip. Kite, kite fishing is a whole different ball game for uh, for kingfish. It's something that it's really not difficult. You think about it, and you you think that it's tough to do, but it really isn't. It's you know a piece of cake. The hardest part is just getting it to fly. Once you get the kite up there, we were fishing two weeks ago in Palm Beach. The first day, every fish that we hooked was on a kite tape. There were goggle eyes that were just, and you can't get goggle eyes over here for the most part. I've caught one in 20, 30 years of fishing out here. But what else can you use on the kite out over here? You can use runners, but for a trick for a runner, if you don't do nothing to them, they'll pull your kite down or even pop the clip. 
So you want to cut the bottom tail fin so they don't have any of the pressure to yank the kite down. So what do you do? You drift it? But when you do a kite setup, are you drifting or do you anchor? You can, you can anchor, you can drift, and a lot of times, I was slow troll when we're kite fishing. You've got to have a crew that, that can handle it to slow troll and kite fish because you'll be moving that kite all the way around the boat. you got to make sure your antennas are down because if your antennas are up on the T-top, a lot of times you'll see boys fishing over on the east coast in a uh, 33 top with no T-top at all on it. It's just got the center console because they're running two and three kites. And how do you get the kites to, to run more than one kite? Uh, you just have multiple clips on each kite with a swivel, catching each clip as it goes out. We know we're getting like 70 feet from each clip. And as you're running, uh, trolling actually, you want to bring your long lines in farther because as you do a 360 or turn on the wreck or whatever bottom you're fishing, your kite doesn't come across your lines in the back as you're trolling. Now, if you want to fish more than one kite, what do you do? We don't, we don't usually don't fish more than one when we're trolling. You only fish more than one when you're drifting or anchored up. And you get the kites to separate, what do you do? Uh, you can put a uh, split shot on one side of the kite to get it to go the one way you want it to fly. So if you put them on the right side, it's going to fly to the right. If you put them on the left, it'll fly to the left, it's going to fly apart. When we're, when we're out there fishing, and, and as I said, we're primarily slow trolling, one of the things that the guy who's running the boat, you think he's just driving the boat. That's not the case. You can't just go out there and fish and push the autopilot and just troll. You need to be watching your chart plotter. You need to be watching your uh, bottom machine. You need to mark on that chart plotter where the big schools are. You need every time that a fish hits, you need to touch that, that chart plotter because you want to go back to that spot. And a lot of times you'll get bit again in that same area because the fish are there. You can talk to somebody who, uh, who has trolled around the peaks a lot and who knows it backwards and forwards. I mean, I think he knows every bump on the bottom. I'm thinking about going out there and dropping a few crab traps just to mess them up. Thank you, for so when you're doing a kite fish, are you using a stinger rig, or are you just going with a single No, you'll, you'll use a stinger rig. And you're basically, when you're kite fishing, you're going to shoulder hook your bait. You're going to hook them right in front of the dorsal fin or right behind the head. Right. You're going to um, run one or, or more stinger. Uh, some, I've seen guys run two stingers on them just right above the, the hook that's hooked in the dorsal so that they're just free going up and down the, your uh, your wire leader. Now your wire leader is going to be a lot longer on your kite rigs. The, yeah, you're going to have a four foot leader on your kite rig. Um, a lot of times when, when you're kite fishing, your fish will be skying on your base. You know, that, that bait just entices that kingfish to come out of the water and go after them. So you want to have a long enough leader that it's not going to double back on it and cut it off. And what about when you're actually doing the trolling? So if you're not, not kite fishing, how far, how much of a leader do you have in front of that I, I usually do a 12 inch leader in front of my J-hook. Um, you, you don't have to use just a J-hook though. I mean, I, I have friends who kingfish who use strictly treble. They'll just take one prong of that treble and hook it through the nose of that bait. What about nose hook and bait? Put it right through the nose. No. <laughs> if you want your bait to swim towards one side or the other, hook it that way and the bait will gravitate towards that side of the boat, okay? And it's just a little different angle of pull, and it's not that noticeable, but you'll notice it a little bit. And it, it works quite well for keeping your line spread out. What about the downriggers? <laughs> downriggers. They're, they're as important as kites. Yep. Basically, a downrigger is just a weight on a big fishing reel. It goes up and down the cliff, 
just the same concept as a kite. Your line goes down, twist about eight times, six to eight, one for good luck. <laughs> you clip it down or you send it down, depending on how deep you're really fishing, staggered depths. But if you're on the beach, do you even use it down here? If I'm fishing the drop, I usually don't use a downrigger. If I if I do, I'll put just the line in the clip at the water's height. Because usually when you're fishing that shallow, the fish is going to see your bait. And you don't have to lower the presentation. On the uh, downriggers, you can use two of them. You run one down deeper and one up higher so that you can cover the water column, uh, especially when you're offshore. I always tend to run my dead bait, my ribbon fish, my dead Spanish mackerel down on the lower one and use my blue runner or my live cigar minnow on the one that's higher up in the water column. When you're looking at the bottom machine, turn the gain up a little bit where you see the differentiation in the uh, the echo returns that you're getting is where the thermocline is going to be. You see it at 50 foot? Where are you going to want to put your downrigger? 50 foot. No. And don't forget, when, you, when you're running your downrigger, you also got to have some blowback. Okay, you, you get blowback and you get more with mono than you do with wire. Wire gives you a hump. Uh, that's one thing that about twisting the line when you put it in the downrigger clip. Uh, when you're kite fishing, you do not twist the line in your uh, kite clips. You let the line run, run through. On the downrigger, you just take it and put two fingers in it, wrap it six times, and then take that loop and put it in the downrigger clip. Now, there, there's also all different kinds of downrigger clips. I prefer the, uh, the Blacks type, which is a single wire. Uh, it's also a half-co gold, gold finger clip. But you can use the Canon squeeze pads but you still want to twist it, and, and that way you're 30 foot behind the downrigger where your bait is, which is about what I put mine at. You can have run them a little closer, you can run them a little further back. If you run them too far back, it can get mixed up with your prop bait because it has too much line and it'll, it might swim up and get tangled with your prop bait. And the last thing you want when you're fishing is tangled. One other thing about when you're trolling your bait, you want to stagger them. We have always done a, uh, a long line on the uh, port side, which is always our longest. Then we run a medium, and then we'll run our downriggers, and then our last bait out is usually right in the prop wash. So your first bait in, and right when your rod goes off, would be your downrigger, so it gives the driver able to turn without getting conducted into the prop. Many people have the advantage of an electric downrigger, which is nice because you can just press a button and then, I mean, the guy who grabs the rod, if the fish hits on the downrigger, you grab the rod, you press the button, bingo, it's, it's coming in. It usually stops right at the level of the water. Um, other than that, you got to hustle. You crank that downrigger as best you can. Get it in, because the last thing you want is for your fish to swim around that downrigger line and, and lose that winning kingfish. That's $75,000. <laughs> How do you approach a, re a wreck that you've never fished before? When I come off plane, I put baits out. Okay, I like to have, you, you do a lot better with baits in the water. And, uh, the, uh, the, the way I approach a wreck that I've never fished before, probably going to run right over the top of it and just to see what's there and to see where I'll start marking bait and then I'm going to go from there and as I said I'm, I'm watching my my machines and uh, looking at, at what's going on also you got to pay attention to bird action everything else you got to look for them birds a lot of times birds will birds will let you know where the bait is and a lot of times they'll let you know where the fish are. Do you use any planers? Do I? I? I don't use any planers. I use planers when I spoon fish. <coughs> but most of the time I'm not spoon fishing. Um, I'm live bait fishing. 
And it's hard to use a planer with a live bait. You can you can bring up what they call a poor man's downrigger, which will be like a number four planer. And you can run a little thing with a paper clip and a rubber band and send your bait down on this on the on the planer. So it's running at about 30 feet behind the planer. And then it'll it'll pop off, the paper clip stays down, and you can run another one. But I don't I don't usually use the planers when I'm when I'm turning the fish. What do you think about outriggers? Outriggers, I have used them. I I usually only use one when I'm king fishing. Um, they're out, you know, that's what I'm five bait king fishing. I'll use I'll use one and it's usually gonna be my poor one and I'm gonna use it on my longest bait and get it out. It does get it out of the prop wash. But when you're only going one and a half to two knots, you really don't have a lot of prop wash to worry about. When you're trolling valley do, you want to use both, both outriggers. And you want to skip your bait, you usually want to run, want to run about five knots and get your bait. But your, your weather conditions and, and how much your, uh, your sea, you look at your sea conditions, you look at that, how the bait's acting, and you vary your speed according to that, but you definitely want to use your outriggers to get your base out off to the side of the boat. Are you pulling the chum bag? Definitely. Definitely. Especially here. Um, now chumming's a whole other story. Well if you're chumming, you can you can't get sharks. So if you start seeing a lot of sharks you want to stop chumming. But chumming's great. You get a nice wheel slit. Or if it's even better if you get a live bill full of white bait. And as you get out there, just throw one white bait every once in a while. And fortunately, you'll see the kingfish sky on the white bait, not the bait. But uh, what you got to No, uh, Aylesworth makes some some tremendous chum. Uh, they get Dawn Special is one of my favorites. It's got anus oil in it, and it's uh, a lot of Manhattan oil. They have they have all different kinds of chum down there, and, and it's really something that you you want to work with because it's. Uh, it's, it's going to get you more bites. When I'm anchored up, I'm usually going to be balloon fishing. Okay, and by balloon fishing, I mean that instead of rolling my baits, I'm going to stagger them on balloons, and I'm going to use different colors, although red is my favorite. Uh, and you just tie a balloon on. I usually tie it about four feet above the, uh, the hook. And let the bait go out, and your wind and your current will take it. You're, you're going to be anchored, and the, the boat's going to have, you know, your anchor heading, and then your baits are going to go out behind. But you got to got to keep your eye on them all the time because they're going to swim around. They can swim up front. They can go under the anchor. They can do everything. You just have to monitor it a lot. And if you got two or three guys, it's no problem. You just assign one guy. You're the red balloon. You're the orange yellow balloon. You're the green balloon. It works well. How far do you like to put them out? As far as I can get away with, you know, I, li I like them out a long way. I, I like to, to put them out up to 100 feet, maybe 120. Yeah, when you make the decision to abandon plan A or plan B, what, <laughs> if you find the afternoon you don't have a fish, how do you go to leave? Or just try, try, try. A lot of times, it's, it's, that's that's a tough call because I've gone out and I, I one thing that that is the best thing you can do for tournament fishing is to pre fish because you find out where fish are. One of the problems is if you pre fish and you catch fish at four o'clock in the afternoon on uh, the day before the tournament. You go out there the day of the tournament and you sit there all day long and say, well, they did it at 4 o'clock yesterday. Are you going to stay? I'm not. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to run about, I'm going to give every place a good hour, two hours. You know, you can't, you don't know whether 10 minutes is going to produce fit. But, you know, when, when I fish in Mississippi, and I'm going around the rig. We'll say we're going to make two passes around it, or one pass around it. And you can do the same thing out here. You can go out there and say I'm going to make one pass around the peaks. 
What about clear your baits? When you guys clear your baits, you, you try to uh, save a bait in live well, then just toss the rest. You put, a, you put a new bait on every time you bring a bait in. Never reuse a bait. First off, when I have a fish on, my long bait's going to stay out there to try and catch another fish. Because you're not fishing if your bait's in the live well. So, you're fishing one, you know, you're fighting one, and you're fishing one. The other ones, I will put in the well, because I want to be able to put them right back out again. And you can tell when you bring them in whether they're beat up. Uh, mullets get, tend to get more red nose than, than other baits. You know, and, and your smaller baits get pretty beat up pretty quick. Blue runners and, and cigar minnows are usually pretty hardy. They'll, they'll last for several deployments. What about wreck and stone for AJs? How do you fish around those? Oh, wrecks that are known for AJs, I stay on the perimeter. I definitely am not going to go straight over the wreck because that's where the jacks are going to be concentrated. And uh, a lot of times, it's a far perimeter too, because jacks are, are easy to, they, they'll zero in on you, and then sometimes you'll have to run away from them to get to them. But you're not going to run into too many jacks fishing King of the Beach. In your other tournaments you are, where you're fishing deeper. Although jacks, since they're closed now, they, I guess they multiply a lot too. Where would you go for blue runners? Where would I go for blue runners? This weekend. This weekend? <laughs> I, I would look at South County. I would look at the, uh, I haven't been down south to that uh, Green Marker outside of Southwest Pass, the one that's three miles out. Yeah. Um, I came through, I marked a lot of it at 9 and 10, but I think, I don't think much of it was runners. I think it was more in the uh, sardines and, and uh, white baits there, but uh, I didn't, I didn't bait fish there. So I, I definitely stopped. Usually we'll start going out the channel. We'll start at 9 and 10. Sometimes we'll start at 11. But most of the time, 9 and 10, work our way out. 7 and 8, 5 and 6, 3 and 4, all the way to the whistle. If you haven't found them by then, you go down to the chemical barge, you run out to the fin barge. How many days prior to the tournament do you start getting the bait? You can, and then how do you keep it? You want to get a bait jail, preferably a soft sided for, for here. In other locations, you can use hard-sided jails. We get so many, if you're going to keep bait for a while, you, you have to have a soft-sided one because we'll have the particles form too quick here. We have a very high salinity content and we got a lot of uh, a lot of growth. Yes, sir? If all you're getting is schooling, do you move? It depends how long I'm, I'm there. If, yeah. I have I have left fish to find fish because if all you're getting is ten pounders and you've caught you've gone through fifteen rigs and every fish has been eight to ten pounds, I'm gonna go someplace else. If I ever use a Ross report, yes. Mitch Roffer uh, and and there are there are innumerable uh, new places, innumerable. SSTs. You can you can even go to the satellite use yourself online and, and put together your your temperature analysis is, and you can actually create your own analysis of of where the temperature breaks are. You can even see the chlorophyll. Um, it's really a science in and of itself. It's a lot easier for me to get a rock report where they've done all the work and all the homework for me, and they tell me where to go to fish. Which is a good good way to pinpoint areas that you want to target. They will also show you which direction that current's moving. And a lot of times we know the bottom better than the Roth chart does. So we can see this and we can see, oh that current's heading this way. Hey, it's gonna go right over that hard bottom that I know about that's right there. So that's where you might want to concentrate some of your fishing efforts. Do you troll with the current or against the current? And I troll both with it and against it. But I vary my speed. I'm watching how my bait is behaving on the line and uh, how, how it, it has to look natural. If it doesn't look natural, you know, you're wasting your time. I will have to go into the current 
with more speed than if I'm riding with the current. A lot of times when you're running with the current, especially if it's a, a, a good current, like on the East Coast, we were fishing uh, over by uh, an area called Lost Tree. You could try for an hour and a half trolling south, and you'd be a quarter mile north of where you were. Because you're, you're, you're bucking the Gulf Stream, and it's, it just, yet you can turn around and drift a mile in 15 minutes. It's, uh, so you have to you have to weather that, and also whether you're trolling with the current or against the current. Sometimes you got to tack and head out at an angle in order to make progress towards a location that you want to be. How important is it on tournament day? What are some of your pointers around team dynamics? What are what are the pointers about team dynamics? Everybody has to have a job on the boat, and, and everybody has to know their job and everybody else's job, because you're not always going to be the guy in the cockpit, okay? I always used to love to be the guy in the cockpit. I find out now, most of the time, I wind up driving the boat, okay? But you have to know everything. When I used to fish with me, Ira, and Jimmy, we could fish all day long, not have to say a word to each other. We could, everybody knew their job, everybody knew what they had to do. You, I might have to come off the wheel and gaff a fish. Uh, you know, it, it just, everybody has to know how to do everything to an extent. And basically that's how a team's built because everybody pitches in, everybody does what they have to do because you're trying to win a tournament. And there is no I in team. You gotta, you gotta be a whole team. You mean, the King of the Beach? Only twice. But many, many years ago. So. Not when it was big money.